I don't know about you, but I hate magic tricks. I really can't stand them. And when I think about why, I guess it's because I can never work them out. And when you do find out how they're done, you feel such a fool, don't you? Because they're always so simple. And how does the magician do that? What the magician does, of course, is to get you to focus on the detail. He gets you to listen to what he's saying. He gets you to watch his hands. He gets you to do anything but look at the big picture. And for me, business is exactly the same. It conspires every day to suck us into the detail, into the mud and the bullets. And what I want to spend a few minutes talking about this evening are, are the benefits of getting up there in the helicopter, the benefits of getting up there and looking at the big picture, looking at the big picture of sales strategy. So what are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about staying in the helicopter for sparkling sales. I, um, I've got to share with you, this is, uh, this is absolutely true. A little while back, I was speaking to about 800 people, and at this point, a guy in the audience stood up. And he said, excuse me, excuse me, but that helicopter's a hooey, and the noise is an Apache. <laughs> I mean, there's someone really focused on the detail, right? So no helicopter experts here, please. So we're going to talk about sparkling sales in good times or bad. So where do we start in this helicopter of ours? Well, let's start with aspiration. What, what's the, uh, the biggest drinks brand in the world, please? Anybody? Biggest drinks brand? Coca-Cola. Coca Sir, I, I do apologise. You're now a bank manager. Twelve years ago, I come along to you, I say, Mr. Bank Manager, I've got this brilliant idea. Brilliant idea! I want to take on Coca-Cola head on, give us some money. What do you say? No, I thought not. Now have a look at this. These are some figures I've got together. They are the retail price per gallon of various liquids in the USA. So here we go. Coke is about $3.40 a gallon. Gasoline's about the same. Milk's about the same. Evian water is $6.20 a gallon. So if you're uh, the sales director of Evian water in the States, you're going to be ringing Paris, aren't you? Give us a bonus. Give us a bonus. Look how clever I am. I am selling water at twice the price of Coke. Don't do it. Don't do it. Just wait. Budweiser. That's pretty well all water anyway, isn't it? That's about $8.40 a gallon. Now, just look at this. Red Bull is $32 a gallon. Started by an Austrian guy, and the bank manager did say no, so he borrowed a few thousand euro from his family. It's actually the drink the tuk-tuk drivers drink in Bangkok. It's sold as a high-caffeine drink. In reality, the caffeine content of one can of Red Bull is exactly the same as one cup of coffee. It's sold in 142 countries, and Coke and Pepsi are wetting themselves trying to compete. But why am I showing you this? Well, very simply, never, never be frightened of your competition. Never get into the mindset of thinking, you know what? We can only ever be number two, because you know what? If you think like that, you only ever will be number two. You can do anything. You can do absolutely anything. There are many, many examples today of companies that have gone from zero to ruling the world in no time at all. You can do the same with Derry's help. <laughs> so where next? Got ourselves crystal clear about our aspiration. What next? Well, statistically, Market leaders are more successful than anyone else. So it's worth having a look at what, mar what makes market leaders tick. A couple of American guys did a massive piece of research into market leaders worldwide. All kinds of sectors, all kinds of sizes of business, from the very smallest to the very largest. And they produced this massive tome. And if you distill that down to the truths at the core, they are these. What they say is, if you wish to be a market leader, then you need to be a market leader in one of these three disciplines and at least industry average in the other two. So let me put some meat on the bone. Operational excellence, the essence here, is being the lowest cost provider in the market. And the characteristics of a business driven by operational excellence are these. So what type of businesses are driven by operational excellence? Well, Courier companies would be an obvious one. McDonald's, 
And that starts to tell you something about these businesses. These sorts of business not only know the cost of every transaction in their business, they know the profitability of every transaction in their business, and they sell on price. Indeed, these are the only ones that should sell on price. Budget Airlines. I don't know if you saw the other day, there was an interview with O'Leary. Yeah? MD of, uh, of Ryan Airlines. And he was painfully honest, because, I don't know if you've heard this, that he's, they are thinking of charging extra for disabled people and children. And you go, you can't do that. But in the interview, he said, we don't want them. We don't want them, because they ruin our operational excellence. Now, he's being painfully honest, because that's what the business is driven by. But operationally excellent businesses can only be successful if they are the lowest price. A lot of online businesses are driven by operational excellence. Product leadership. The essence here is pushing the boundaries of the market with innovative products or processes. It isn't necessarily a product, it might be a process. Amazon have totally changed the way that we buy books because of their innovative process. And the characteristics of a business driven by product leadership are these. So who are we talking about? Well, the most obvious, of course, is Apple. What you've got to have is a perception of innovation. It doesn't have to be innovation. It has to be a perception of innovation. And what you do, of course, is you charge an awful lot for that. In marketing terms, it's called product surround. I've just bought, not that, but that over there. It's a MacBook Air. I bought it last year. It cost me, what, five times probably what I could have paid for a P uh, P PC. But I love it. I'd sleep with it if I could. It's amazing. I am over the moon with it. Five times more. And that's what you do. It's all about perceived added value. And this one, product and services generate anticipation and excitement amongst customers. My wife and I happened to be in Covent Garden, I think it was 18 months ago, when they opened the new Apple store there, and it was about the time they were launching the iPad. And as you got closer, there was these, these queues. I mean, it was like immigration in New York, you know, these great snaking queues like this. And as we got closer, we realised there were two queues, and the sign in front of the longest one said, queue here if you wish to buy an Apple product today. What would we do for that, eh? Amazing. Other obvious candidates would be Dyson. That's the classic one. Yeah, it came out with 142 patents and a product that everyone thought was at the end of its life cycle. I think it used to be Sony, but they bought Columbia Pictures and totally lost their way. But that's another story. And then finally, we've got customer intimacy. And the essence here is developing the relationship with your chosen customers that they most value. There's some Really important words here, you are choosing your customers, they are not choosing you. And you're giving them what they most value. And these are the characteristics you'll see. By the way guys, I noticed some of you writing, all my slides are there for you to download and it's on your seat, the domain name. So what sort of businesses are we talking about here? Well typically the high street, with the exception of the discount end. The discount end would be operational excellence, everyone else, it's a customer intimacy. What about supermarkets? We go into Waitrose knowing we are going to pay more than we would pay at Asda or Tesco, don't we? Why do we do that? It's all about customer intimacy. We are prepared to pay more because of that intimacy we have. Tesco, incidentally, driven by operational excellence. There is no other grocer in the world who has got the sort of detailed information that they've got. They have mathematical algorithms written by PhDs for every product in every branch they have in the world to maximise sales and minimise wastage. That's what operational excellence is all about. Service industry should be the banks. I don't know many where it applies. Maybe one or two of the internet banks. So, OK, let's see if we've got, uh, we've got the idea here. So here we go. Three companies, company A, company B and company C. Which one's got it right? Remember, you've got to be a market leader in one and at least industry average in the others. And the answer's B. 
Incidentally, you cannot be a market leader in more than one, because whichever one you select, that's the culture that's going to be reflected right throughout your organisation. The sort of people you recruit will be different. Your management and leadership style will be different, depending upon which one of these three is the right one for your business. If you're like A, market leader in one, fast follower in another, but the third is below average, sooner or later that will drag you down. I don't know if you remembered last year, um, Sainsbury's were absolutely busting a gut on this, on customer intimacy, putting massive effort into it, massive investment into it. And then we read in the papers, they were having stockouts on their shelves. Well, you've blown it. If you haven't got products to sell, you can't be intimate with anybody. So the trick is you've got to be a leader in one and at least industry average in the other two. So, what about your organisation? What shape is your organisation and what shape would you like it to be? What is the driver? Because if you are driven by operational excellence, that changes the whole strategy of the business, but it definitely changes the sales strategy because you are going to sell on price. That is the only one that should be selling on price. The other two, you're not selling on price. You're, all, you're selling on perceived added value. And you are weaving a web around that perceived value based upon either product leadership or customer intimacy. Okay. So where have we got to in this helicopter? Clear about our aspiration? And hopefully now we're pretty clear about what shape we want to be in terms of this disciplines of market leaders. Now what? Well, what I'd like to do with, you now is just do with you now is just share with you a whole new dynamic I'm seeing out there in the marketplace. Because things have changed. Things have changed, I think, forever. No one's mediocre anymore. If you've got a mediocre product or service, to be honest, you've either gone or you're on the way of going. And if you are painfully honest about your product or your service, actually, it's pretty well the same as everybody else's. Might be a little bit better, might be a little bit worse. And what I am increasingly seeing is that the way by which people are differentiating themselves from the competition is all about the process they take their customers through. I'll put this on a little chart. So here we go. On the y-axis is your product or service, meeting expectations, better than or not meeting. And on the x-axis is the process you take your customers through. Satisfied, dissatisfied, delighted. So let's say you recommend a restaurant to me, I go along, I have a fantastic meal, it's even better than I expected, it's going to be somewhere along here. But in reality, it took two hours to come and the waiter had his thumb in the soup, it's going to be in that box. Where you need every single one of your customers, ladies and gentlemen, are in the green and yellow boxes. The ones in the top right will be advocates, they will be a free sales force for you. They will say, do you know what? Peter Liner and the Academy for Chief Executives, fantastic product. It's absolutely amazing what they do. But they are such a delight to do with business with. He is such a delight to do business with. The green ones will be loyal, but everyone else you're either at risk of losing or you've already lost. When, um, when Lexus set up, sorry, when Toyota set up Lexus, their luxury car division, as you would expect, they did a massive piece of research. And they came to the conclusion that as far as the car was concerned, the product, they could not assume they could build a car that was better than Mercedes-Benz, Jaguar or BMW. They had to assume they could only build a car that was as good as. So they took the strategic corporate decision that the way by which they were going to differentiate themselves from the competition was all about this access. And I had a great example of this the other day. Friend of a friend, been a bit of a BMW lover. Put his car in for a service, and as usual, they did a free valet, and it came back, and the ashtray was missing. So he rang up the dealer, he said, look, I've just got my car back from a service, and the ashtray's missing. And they said, don't worry, Mr. Taylor, we've got it here, next time you're passing, just call in and we'll let you have it. And he was a bit unhappy with that. So he rang up the local Lexus dealer, he said, can I ask you a question? He said, yes, sir. He said, if I had a Lexus and I put my car in for a service, and it came back and the ashtray was missing, what would you do? Why, Mr. Taylor, we would bring it out to you. Why do you ask? So he told them. Two hours later, the Lexus dealer delivered his BMW ashtray. Guess what car he's now driving? 
That's what you've got to do, ladies and gentlemen. That is the world we are now living in. In 100% is no longer good enough. It has got to be 110% absolutely everywhere you touch a customer. Everywhere you touch a customer. Okay, so where next? Well, let's talk about this sales process that Derry was saying that a lot of us are delinquent in, and I agree with him. I can probably say this, there's probably more nonsense spoken in the sales and marketing business than any other on the planet. There's more daft models, there's more silly acronyms than any other business on the planet. And there's just one model I always come back to, and I just commend it to you. It's called the universal buying process, and it is the process we go through when we buy something. There is no choice. Whether you're buying the services of a lawyer, a tin of baked beans, or a nuclear power station, you have got to go from being unaware of the product, the service, the company, to awareness. You've got to go from awareness to comprehension of exactly what it is that's being offered. You've got to be taken to conviction that it's right for you. And finally, action, place the order. That's it. And very broadly, the first three are marketing and the last two are sales. And what every organisation on the planet needs are mechanisms to get from there all the way through to there. And believe me, an awful lot don't. I went into a company the other day. They service compressors all over the country. I was talking to the MD. I said, so what do you do for sales and marketing? Oh, he said, salespeople. I'm sick of them. Just got rid of the last three. What a waste of space they were. So I said, oh, okay. So what else do you do? Do you have any marketing? No, he said, don't you know what they cost? And he went off on one. So I said, um, okay then. You don't do any marketing. So, um, I, I'll tell you what, I bet those salespeople used to give you great visit reports, didn't they? He said, yeah, they did. How did you know that? I said, it's obvious. If you are not doing marketing, your salespeople are going to, going to be spending all their time up here. You'll get brilliant visit reports, but the chances of them getting down to there are almost zero. This is the job of marketing. That's the job of sales. You have got to do both. And marketing is getting cheaper and cheaper. It's getting easier and easier. And I'm incredibly excited because the world is moving towards the smaller business. I am starting to see smaller businesses running rings round the larger companies because it's getting easier and easier and cheaper and cheaper. Have a little look at this. Why have I shown you that? That company was a relatively small family business in the Midwest of America 18 months ago. And this guy got this idea of videoing himself, blending stuff. So he started out doing fruit and vegetables and stuck them up on YouTube. And he started getting a following. And they'd sort of say, oh, would you blend an aubergine? Would you blend a banana? Or whatever it might be. Until so finally somebody said, would you blend an iPhone? So he did it. If you have a look at that on YouTube, it's been viewed something like 9 million times. But you know, the really interesting thing is, he has never done any advertising but in the last 18 months, his sales have gone up 88%. Marketing cost, zero. Now, I was corrected the other day, not zero, one iPhone, <laughs> to be fair. But I like zero. Zero is a good number when you can get that sort of a response. Last year, Nike paid him $200,000 to blend a trainer. I got three golden rules of marketing. Number one is be creative. Whether you're spending five pounds on a flyer or five million pounds on an advertising program, please, if it is not creative enough, throw it away. And number two, of course, is you don't have to spend very much. And you really don't these days. And number three is don't do what the competitors do. Have we got any lawyers here? Something about lawyers. They think, I think spending money on advertising is a risk. So in their mind, they mitigate the risk by doing exactly what the competition does. Might as well tear up 50 pound notes and throw them down the drain. Who's on LinkedIn? Who gets business through LinkedIn? You should all be getting business through LinkedIn. It is the most amazing marketing program known to man. There are 200 million business people on LinkedIn. It is the most amazing marketing tool. You should be getting business through LinkedIn. And what's the cost? Zero. I like zero. Well, if it's not LinkedIn, it must be Twitter. Who's getting business through Twitter? You should all be getting business through Twitter. Twitter's got a more sophisticated search engine than Google. It's amazing. YouTube. YouTube gets five billion hits a day. Five billion. 
firm of builders merchants in um, Birmingham last summer, small family business, had a student in, vacation student for the summer, and after he'd been there for a bit, he said to his boss, he said, uh, look, old Fred there's retiring next year, and he's got a lot in his head. Do you mind if I take some videos of him? And they said, no, no, as long as Fred doesn't mind, that's fine. So he went along to Fred and said, Fred, you know, what do you need if you're going in to get the asbestos out of a roof? And Fred said, well, you need these boots and this coat. And this lad did 10 three-minute videos. And then he went along to the management. He said, do you mind if I put them up on YouTube? And they said, well, suppose not. Now, he must have known a bit of what he was doing, because he must have put in the keywords. But anyway, he put those up on YouTube. The next month, the very next month, sales of the products shown in those videos were up between 15 and 20%. Nothing else was in the business. Guys, you should be doing this stuff. Cost, zero. And I'm sure Steve is going to be talking about this some more in a few minutes. Guys, everything. Is, to m is moving towards us, smaller and medium businesses. We can one run rings around the large companies. Now, talked a little bit about marketing. Let's get back to sales. <coughs> I work with sales teams sometimes, and when I do, I got a little model I use. I call it my sales management matrix. Because, you know, there is a golden rule. There is a rule of thumb, which is, whatever your business is, whoever is responsible for selling, it might be you, or it might be your sales team, should spend at least 20% of their time prospecting. And my definition of prospecting is talking to people who have never bought from you, or maybe not bought from you in the last three years, let's say. 20% of their time. That's a day a week. That's a day a week. And in these times, it should be more than that. So this little model, really simple. Here we go, y-axis, prospecting, yes or no. Keep it really simple. On the x-axis, orders or however you measure your salespeople, head of budget, behind budget. So when you recruit a new salesperson, they come as juniors. By definition, they're behind budget, and by definition, everything they're doing is prospecting. You want them to move to become stars. Indeed, you want most of your salespeople to be stars. They're ahead of budget, and they are still prospecting. But you know what happens the same as I do, don't you? They get demands placed on them by customers. They get too big for their boots. Oh, pff, prospecting, I, pff, I don't do that. I'm too important. What happens then is they become cows. Now, most sales forces I've worked with, the people who are the most revered are actually cows. They think they're God's gift to the world. They're ahead of budget, and they don't ever so well, and they know how to do it. And when they're, pff, we don't prospect. But of course, all that's needed, and it happens a lot these days, they lose a couple of customers, one moves to China, another one goes bust, and suddenly they're now dogs. Now they're really in trouble because they're behind budget, and of course they haven't been prospecting, so there's nowhere to go. And this is really brutal stuff, because there's two choices for a dog. He or she can learn how to be a junior or leave the company. It's that simple. Now when I work with sales forces, what I try and do, ideally, is to get the salesmen themselves to come up and say where they are with post-it notes. This was a client of mine, and this is where the salesmen themselves said they were. And I said to them, do you think that's good news or bad? And they said, well, it looks pretty, pretty bad to me. I said, I don't look at it like that. Because just imagine, if we can get all of them to stars, if we can get all of them to stars, just think how much better this business is going to do. Where's the centre of gravity of your business? I worked with a um, firm of accountants last year, this, earlier this year, 21 partners, so sizeable firm. And I got pretty frustrated with them, I'll be honest with you. And I stuck this up. I don't usually show this in that circumstance. And I said, please tell me, where is the centre of gravity of this partnership on there? Here, do you think? Do you know what they said? 21 people said, all together, we are cows moving to dogs. That's what they said. And I said, what are you going to do about it? And they said, probably nothing. Now, I don't usually get very angry with my clients, but I went, drove home with white knuckles because that business deserves to go bust. Every business, absolutely every business, you've got to prospect for business. You've got to be proactive. Never again can we take the risk of hoping that customers are going to come and find us. You have got to prospect. And while I'm at it, by the way, I very rarely come across sales managers who know anything about this, who even think like this. Most sales managers spend their time on exactly the wrong thing. They are, I'll throw that in the middle of the, of the room, 
And that probably means most business leaders do too, as far as sales and marketing is concerned. Okay. Would you know, like to know how to double sales? Yeah, would that be all right? Would that be fairly useful? Okay. So let me ask you a question first. Do you agree with me that there's a ratio? The more time your salespeople spend sitting in front of properly pre-qualified leads, the more business you get. Yeah, it's a ratio. A lot of us measure that. It's 10%, it's 20%, it's 5%, whatever it is. Yeah? So if you can double the amount of time your salespeople spend sitting in front of properly pre-qualified leads, you will get double the sales, assuming your market share is less than 80%. Yeah? You cannot disagree with that logic, can you? So here we go. This is some research that was done by Proudfoots and Ericsson in the UK into how salespeople spend their time. 10% prospecting. Now we know that's wrong. 23% actively selling. 15% on service and 52% on travel and administration. What that means is, of course, they're spending exactly a third of their time doing what you pay them to do. Because you're paying them to sit in front of properly pre-qualified leads, sitting in front of customers, aren't you? This is what it ought to be. It ought to be at least 25% on prospecting, 35% actively selling, still 15 on service, and just 25 on travel and administration. And if you can do that, you have doubled the time they spend sitting in front of customers, and the consequence of that has to be that you double sales. That's how easy it is. Guys, that really is how easy it is. But I, can't, again, come across very, very few sales managers, very few business leaders who even think about this stuff. And whose fault is that? Is it the salesman? Of course it isn't. It's your fault. It's your fault. Are you using the very latest technology to help your salespeople? Are you not allowing your salesperson to go out and talk to a customer unless they have done their homework first and there is a better than evens chance of getting the order? Have they had basic sales training? how to work their patch, because you can minimize admin. Have you got your finance people in check and stop asking for silly reports and expense forms from salespeople? And most importantly of all, if you've got a sales manager, is he or she actually spending their time enabling this to happen or having stupid meetings with their salespeople halfway up the motorway once a week? Do you know, I actually went into a company the other day. I didn't think this happened anymore. I went into a company the other day where for the entire sales force, Friday is admin day. I couldn't believe it. They do no selling on a Friday. They spend their time filling in all the forms that the bureaucracy and the business is, has decided to invent. It's nonsense. Guys, it is not, e not difficult to double the sales of your business. Right. I'm sorry if that sounded like a lecture, but I feel fairly strongly about it. <laughs> and something else I fairly str feel fairly strongly about is price. I've already said no one's mediocre anymore. And if you're not mediocre, you are probably very good at what you do. You are probably stonkingly good at what you do. And if you are, ladies and gentlemen, you deserve higher prices. I have to say this twice because it's got to take time to get through the, the grey matter. You deserve higher prices. Tell me, what would happen if you put up your prices 1% 9 o'clock tomorrow morning? What would happen? I'll tell you what would happen. You won't lose a single customer. But it will go straight on the bottom line to reinvest in marketing and sales and the growth of your business. That's the way it works. If you are driven by product leadership or customer intimacy, it's all about perceived added value, as I said earlier. So here we go, another little chart for you. Price, perceived added value. Every buyer in the world, every buyer in the world is trained to do that. That's their job. Their job is to turn your product or service into a commodity. Nirvana for them is buying your product or service at an internet auction. Yeah, none of, the, none of this relationship nonsense, just the lowest price. Your job and the job of your salespeople is to do exactly the reverse. To get the perception of your product or service to a higher added value. That's their job. I used to write into my salesman's contracts, and they absolutely hated this. The very first item in their contract was, your job is to ensure in the list of reasons why customers buy our product, 
price is below number three. They hated it. And by the way, please never ever give salespeople price discretion. They just give it away. It's too easy. That's their job. If you are driven by customer intimacy or product leadership, you have put massive investment into that perceived added value. It's their job to make sure you get it. Okay, people might say, well, we're in hard times now and there's lots of pressure comes on from these buyers and all the rest. But please, don't drop your trousers. Please, don't discount. If you've got to do something, give stuff. Give stuff that costs you very little or nothing but has a high perceived value. Give stuff. And if absolutely, finally, you really do believe you've got to give a discount, make sure you only give that discount in return for something that is not just the order. The psychology has to be, I am giving you a reduction in price, because by the way, that's what discount means. On my laptop, by the way, if you type in discount, discount it blows up. It's a new Apple app, you need to get it, okay? Make sure you get something in return. It might be just a couple of testimonials. It might be a couple of referrals. It doesn't matter. The psychology has to be, our prices are there because of the value we give. I will only reduce those if I get something in return that is not just the order. And by the way, I, I'm an engineer by background as well as a marketer. And when I have my engineer's hat on, I, get my, I find myself thinking logically. And you mustn't do it. Because people don't buy logically. You know, A follows, B follows, C, they place the order. It doesn't work like that. People buy illogically. I don't know if you saw last year, a German test house did a definitive piece of research. They compared a BMW 1 Series with a Ford Focus on 80 counts. Everything you could think of. Absolutely everything you could think of. And not... On, on not one single count did the BMW come out ahead, but the BMW was 32% more expensive and is selling like hotcakes. We do not buy logically. If we bought logically, no one would buy a BMW. BMW is driven by customer intimacy. That's what you're paying for. You want to have it on your drive. Who's got an uh, espresso machine at home? Yes. You've had a number done on you. It, a very... 15? 50. 50. At home? Can I take your temperature? Are you, are you? I also have a coffee roast group. Ah, okay. In that case, it's not quite home. Anyway, they've done a number on us. It's, they've done a very clever number on us. If you've uh, got an espresso machine, then you have to buy these things, yeah? Coffee pods. Now, I'm quite sure, you know, times are hard. We're in a recession. Whoever bought your espresso machine, you or your partner, I am sure did a complete comparison, because that's what you'd do, wouldn't you, in these hard times? You would compare the cost of the coffee pods with ground coffee. Those were Tesco's prices last week. Now, if you do that comparison, this is what you see. The coffee is three times, three times more expensive. Three I'm sure you did that, Tanya, didn't you? Sure you did. Of course you did. In which case you would not have bought an espresso machine. But they've done a number on us, a very clever number, and I know the marketing company that have done it. And this is the comparison they've got us to make, and it's quite different. Look at that. Look how much I am saving myself. It is very, very clever. Maybe you can do the same in your business. People do not buy logically. Cranfield um, University, Professor Malcolm McDowell, Cran Cranfield University, over many years now, has been monitoring pricing. Their belief, their absolutely firm belief is, worldwide, on everything that's bought by everybody, both B2C and B2B, no more than 10% is actually bought on price. So 90% is bought illogically. And we all need to tap into that. Okay. What I'd like to finish with today is a model, which won't surprise you, but it's my favourite model. It's called the Change House. And what we have is a house with four rooms. And the argument is that any organisation, whether it's a company, a division, a sales team, or indeed an individual, at any moment in time you are in one of these four rooms. And furthermore, you can only move from room to room in a predetermined way. So let me put some meat on the bone. 
the room of contentment. This is all about, we know what we're doing. Our sales force is the best sales force in the country. We have been the market leader now for 10 years. Go away. That's where Coke was when Red Bull arrived. That's where Microsoft was when Search arrived, and now Google are bigger than they are. That's where Caterpillar was when Komatsu arrived. That's where, in my experience, any government-owned organization has great difficulty not being. It's where Marks... No, no, Marks and Spencer's 10 years ago were in the Sun Lounge. This is where you lie back and you go, it's just so easy making money, isn't it? Just so easy. Fat, dumb, arrogant, conceited. Where you go next, and there's no choice, where you go next is the room of denial. And this is where there's lots of finger pointing. Because, of course, it's all somebody else's fault, isn't it? It's the government. It's the banks. It's the recession. It's the jubilee. It's the weather. It's the exchange rate. It's our market sector. It's absolutely anyone but me. And half the, it's a bit like being an alcoholic. You know, half the battle is recognizing you are one. You need some sort of catalyst to get you and your team out of the torpor that you're in. Otherwise, you end up in the dungeon of denial, and that's when the receivers are in. And your sales manager is still going, oh, don't worry, it's just a temporary blip. Just a temporary blip. That catalyst in a smaller organization is someone like Derry or like one of your colleagues here who gives you wholly objective, unsentimental advice and says, look, sunshine, I think you're in denial and you need to do something about it. Assuming you do that, where you go next is the room of confusion. This is where you're half doing it the old way and you're half doing it the new way. It's ever so confusing for the employees. One of the dangers is the employees say, look, for years we've been told we're going in this direction. Now we're being told to sell to these people. Do you know the safest thing we can do? Keep our heads down. And then they're in the paralysis pit and the whole place seizes up. So leadership from you is at a real premium here. You've got to keep repeating the message. This is where we're going. This is where we're going. There's also a danger of the wrong direction door. How many sales forces have I seen wherein these times they go, ah, you know what it is? We're selling through distribution. We ought to sell direct. We're selling direct. Do you know what we ought to do? We ought to sell through distribution. I see it all the time. It's just an excuse. Out the wrong direction door and nothing changes. But of course, where you're trying to get to is the room of renewal. The room of renewal is where you challenge every paradigm in your business. There is absolutely nothing that you or your sales force does simply because they've always done it that way. You pick it up, you look at it, you go, is that right for the future, yes or no? If it's no, even if it's, if it's the crown jewels that your entire strategy was built on, you throw it away. It's also where you're always raising the bar. You are always saying, we can do better, but we can do better. But there's a big danger when you're in the room of renewal, because you know what? The room of contentment is very attractive, it's very alluring. There's a big suction trying to suck you over. And what I would say to you is this, ladies and gentlemen, Nothing's a given anymore. There's no customer loyalty these days. There's technology. Technology might come along tomorrow and wipe you out. And if you are not in that room of renewal, if your sales force is not in that room of renewal, you stand no chance of dealing with it. So what I'd say to you is this. If you can get yourself, get your sales force into that renewal room, and put down an anchor there, I absolutely guarantee your sales will sparkle. Thank you very much.